this webinar. I'm sure most of us have felt pretty safe working from home for most of the year, but I'm sure there'll be some key learnings we can gain from this webinar that we can use once we're in the office and dealing with people again. My name is Marie Van Ash, and I'm one of the members of the AFA Inspire Committee. Inspire aims to foster a supportive and inclusive community of female financial professionals and also provide our members with opportunities for professional networking, mentoring, leadership, and personal growth. I'd also like to introduce the other members of the Inspire Committee. We have Jasmine Tocock and Tara Water as our co-chairs, Julia Colacci and Georgia Mara. Um, also like to, as a new committee, say that we are proud to present our first Inspire event for the year. And through this webinar, we hope to shed some light and provide some valuable insights on unconscious bias and harassment in the workplace. From this webinar, we have up to one hour CPD points available and AFA will send the details within this next week. And as a webinar attender, you will be on mute during the webinar. However, if you would like to ask any questions, please, please use the Zoom QA function, uh, not the chat function. You can use a chat function if you'd like to um, use some comments in there and Jasmine and Tara will be managing that. So to deliver this, we have our guest speaker, Angela Godfrey, Director of Angela Godfrey and Associates. Angela has over 25 years of successful and diversified HR generalist experience gained in blue chip organizations. Angela has a proven track record in successfully solving um, complex HR organizational issues and has specialized in all facets of HR from recruitment to strategy and compliance. Angela is passionate about helping SME businesses formulate and implement effective workplace policies that promote diversity, inclusion, and safety. It is my pleasure to hand over to Angela. Thank you, Marie, and welcome everyone. And thanks for the opportunity to talk to you today. So there are two main topics I'm gonna to be talking about today. And the first one is what we call unconscious bias. And unconscious bias is one of these topical um, uh, discussions that have, uh, that have appeared in the corporate world. And we'll be talking about what is unconscious bias and, and how do we stop it in the workplace. And secondly, um, we'll be talking about some changes to the sexual harassment laws that were handed back down by federal parliament in, in April of this year. And I guess the focus today is whilst it's on gender diversity, I'll be talking about a conscious bias can be uh, whether it be race, whether it be ethnicity, whether it be age. But we're just focusing on today on, on diversity and gender diversity and how the impact of a conscious bias. So I guess before we get into the detail, um, I don't know how many coffees everyone's had today, but I've got a bit of a brain teaser for you. So have a look at this, um, this, this statement here. This, this talks about a surgeon. Have a look and tell me, how could this be so? So have a read through. If you'd like to make some comments on the chat, please do as to what you think and debate what it is. And indeed the facilitators would also um, have a review for you of this as well. Hopefully everyone's had an opportunity to read through. Um, I'm just might throw it to the, to, to, the, to the panel. What's your observations? What, what, what's it actually saying? Just to get our brains working here. What's it actually saying? We also have a couple of comments in the chat yes, box. Please. Excellent. Some, yeah, good observations. Please. Ian Can Knight, <laughs> the surgeon is the son's mother. Yep. Um, Another one, he has two dads. Mm, mm, mm. Well, it's interesting. When I first did this, I said the surgeon's got two dads. And then I thought, oh, maybe the surgeon's got um, a stepfather. Uh, and, and isn't that surprising? Because the person that came up with the answer said the surgeon is female is absolutely right. And you might say to yourself, what are you saying that makes me feel uncomfortable that I'm not egalitarian? 
and that I've got this bias and I didn't assume that it was a female. But let me try and sort of put your mind at rest somewhat. Um, scientists have, um, have investigated this. Our brains are bombarded with some 11 million pieces of information at one time. And our brain can only process 40 to 50 bits. So what we do, we shortcut. We shortcut how we make decisions. So imagine, you know, you're going to Woolies and you, you think you every, every week you're ordering your, your, your groceries and you hit the quick reorder because you know what you want. It just bypasses. You don't have to think about it. And I guess when we, when we shortcut these things, we also take into account what we call um, our, our assumptions, which could be our beliefs, it's our work styles, it's our values, it's our personalities, where we came from. All this goes up to making our decisions. So I guess you're wondering, well, why on earth did our brains evolve this way? Well, it goes back to evolution. So imagine... You know, you're faced with a, a, a saber-toothed tiger. Is it going to kill you? <laughs> or are you going to eat it? You know? So is this person friend or foe? Your brain has to make some really snap decisions. And I know that's not necessarily the case now, but it's something that we've transferred and it's something that we continue to actually do. So imagine you're at a party. I know what I do. Look, I'm a bit of a party animal. I love parties. I'm an extrovert. But even I, at the beginning, will deviate towards people that I feel, oh, they're kind of like me. I can probably strike up a conversation. So it's really important to, to, to be aware of that. Um, so unconscious bias doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing. But where it becomes a bad thing is where, and where it becomes problematic, is when it leads to prejudice. And when it leads to poor decision making and poor analysis. And let me show you an example. I did some research, and, and there's a hospital, um, uh, John Hopkins Hospital in the US. And doctors were treating females and males for preventable blood clots. And they couldn't understand why the, why the women were dying more than the men. They couldn't understand. Put simply, there was some unconscious bias in the decisions they were making because they were actually not assuming that women had the same risk factors as the man and they treated them differently. Imagine this scenario. Um, a female is, um, she's in her 20s, she's complaining of chest pains. A man in her his 50s is complaining of chest pains. He's middle-aged. You're going to assume the man's having a heart attack, not necessarily the woman. And I'll talk about what happened with the John Hopkins uh, situation where that unconscious bias began to creep in and what they did, which was a really simple thing. And we'll talk about that later. Okay. So some stats, and they are sobering stats. So women make up the private sector workforce over 50%. But as you can see, the higher they get into the organisation, the less there are of them. Now, there's been some work done on uh, getting uh, uh, directors into boards, but there's still, if you look at chair boards, there's still 14.6. So why is this so? The, the higher up you go in the organisation, why aren't women getting those jobs? And we'll, we'll explore that a little bit later. But it's quite sobering, isn't it? I also did some research, and this is, comes from AFA, that says that um, financial planners in Australia, only 20% are women. That's quite a startling statistic, isn't it? So what we've got to say to ourselves is, if women represent over 50% of, of um, the population, or indeed the workforce, we've got to try and look at how we represent women through the profession as well. And I think workplaces, as well as the government, have um, some obligations to look at some things that they can do uh, in terms of turning around this unconscious bias and bringing it to the attention. 
And the things, the initiatives that um, I've, I've been working on with, with organisations is things such as flexible working. Um, look at attracting females into professions at school where there's more men, it's more male dominated. Look at ensuring you've got no gender pay gaps. You've got none of that. It may not be conscious, but that unconscious bias. And, and I guess being careful not to make um, those gender bias assumptions. Now, the, the great thing about, apart from the fact that um, uh, discrimination or unconscious bias is, is not a good thing, it's, it's not good for the workforce. Um, it's also, if you think from an economic and simply commercial point of view, there are benefits, of course the benefits. So here's some interesting stats. So since 1974, the economy has been boosted by 22% by having more females in, females in organisations. There's certain studies that have been done that go to show that if you're focused on gender diversity in the executive team, you're more likely going to get a 21% more above average profitability. So it makes good economic sense. The other one about, we talk about gender pay gaps. There's also the issue of gaps when it comes to superannuation because women step out for caregiving as well. So it's not just about pay, it's about super. And they are saying are gonna retire 40% less super than men. And so the burden on the government in terms of providing support to females is quite high. So it makes sense, doesn't it, to get females into the workforce and get, and, and get them included in, in underrepresented professions as well. Now, we talked about, I talked before about um, organisations looking at flexible working, looking at initiatives to eradicate unconscious bias. I'm just going to share something with you. About two weeks ago, I went into SEEK and I did an experiment. And I thought, right, okay, I want to look at some adverts. And on the right is an advert for a very large financial services organisation. And on the left was for a manufacturing of a production scheduling role in manufacturing. And what was startling about this was it immediately made me go, well, that's a role for a female, being obviously the one with the for the financial services, and that's a role for a man. And you might say, well, why? Well, manpower, workforce planning. But re research is saying that the recruiting objectives um, such as ambition, assertion, decision-making, being self-reliant, are male-gendered, are male-gendered, while the words committed, connected, interpersonal, collaborative, are more female-gendered roles. And you might say, well, you know, we've just got to be conscious and make sure that, you know, we get a balance between that. But if you're trying to get females into roles which are male dominated consciously or unconscious unconsciously the research is saying I don't feel I want to work in that organization I don't feel comfortable and conversely if you want to get men into roles which are more female dominated we've got to be careful with the words that we use in our adverts and that's really important to to think about and um, one thing I would say is that um, what you can do is take this deeper and further. Try a little experiment. Um, blank out the names of the people that you're recruiting and you're shortlisting for, if, that, if you are involved in recruiting, and see whether, um, you know, you've got some uh, unconscious bias in, in, in some of your decision making. So all I'm saying is just be very careful and very mindful of these when you actually go to advertise shortlist to recruit. All right, this is a really interesting one. Um, I worked in an organization um, in 2016. And it was, uh, I was asked to come onto a, a, an executive team to look at opportunities in Asia Pac for a funds management business. And the company, um, 
who who we were involved with was in Pittsburgh in the Midwest of America, incredibly conservative, very compliance driven, and very uh, it was very sort of interesting in terms of um, the, the the cultural differences. And I was asked by the head of HR um, in that business, did I have a dress policy? And I said, no, don't have a dress policy. Um, you know, it's it's not something that necessarily we, we, we have in, in, you know, we're moving away from being very prescriptive. But, but um, she sent me the dress policy that she's got. And, and, and this is real. This is a extract from the policy. Men are required to wear a suit, dress, shirt, and tie. Women are required to wear suit, pants, or skirt, dress, skirt, with blouse, and or sweater, dress, pants, with blazer, or sweater set. I don't actually know what a sweater set is, but I thought that was really interesting. Um, all employees are required to wear socks or hosiery. Uh, the fact that it's badly worded is, is another issue as well. Um, we now have a look at the um, uh, examples of inappropriate attire. Um, that should not be worn. And again, um, I'd like some observations from the audience or from the panelists as to what, what's this actually saying? Um, I think something that I noted that was kind of interesting towards the end there was um, the facial hair other than the well <laughs> Yeah, Ash. Um, I know that doesn't relate to women specifically, but it does exclude a lot of men of particular religious backgrounds. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that that's something also quite important to point out that it's not just mm -hmm. women um, in the industry who might be uh, facing this unconscious gender bias or unconscious bias. It's it's men as well, um, you know, depending on their sexuality or religious background. Um, and something like this, you know, really excludes specific people from the workplace in a in kind of an uncomfortable way where they have to explain mm. themselves no that's really good georgia thank you just any other comments and observations we've got one comment that someone would yep. not choose to work there hundred percent hundred percent and you know what was really interesting for me about this one? I, I really looked at this um, uh, last night and I shared it with a colleague, an associate of mine. And she said to me, this is bias against young people <laughs> as well. I mean, it's very old fashioned, you know? So you are precluding a certain a generation of, of individuals. And also the other observation is that, you know, it's all about what the women need to do. Um, and I, I love the dress boots. I mean, you can't wear dress boots with a skirt. So fascinating. And, and the other observation that, um, that was the fact this is 2016, it's not like it was 20 years ago. So really, really, inter really interesting observations. So your symbols and the way that you look at your policies, your visuals in your organization, posters up on the wall, those sorts of things, um, you know, the little, it's the little things that go to show what your organisation is all about. And if you are going for a role, be very aware of them. It's not the ones that they talk about, it's the ones that hit underneath the iceberg will help you make some decisions as to what is it a good organisation to work for. We've had a really excellent comment. Um, I have taken a stand on this sort of thing when managing a team. The guys yeah. were expected to wear clothes that were restrictive and females were encouraged to dress in a sexual manner. I threatened to resign unless it changed. Wow, that is really, really amazing. And I have a real problem, again, with dress policies for the very issue that, that um, again, someone could put an impact on with their own unconscious bias as to what is appropriate and what isn't. Can we not trust people to, to act appropriately? And if they do fall out of line, have a conversation. But let's not be punitive and have a dress policy because it can lead to all sorts of things. It just goes to show what sort of organisation and a culture you're trying to create. So when you go to write policies on this, be very mindful of what you're trying to create. So that's really um, an excellent comment. 
have a look at this. Now, these are genuine comments that have been made to me in my career. And believe me, my career is very long. I could have, I could have gone on for another three slides on the comments that I've been that have been made to me. So um, I'll give you some context. Some of them are recent and some of them go back quite a while. Um, the first one is you, you haven't got the HR job because you plan to have children. My twins are 17 now. And I remember being quite sort of shocked and taken aback by it. But in those days, it was quite a while, it was 17 years or 18 years, um, you kind of accepted that. That is not something that we should accept. And um, all the, it may have been seen as well-meaning, um, it wouldn't have stopped me doing the job. It's just, you know, I was of an age and it was assuming I was going to have children. Now, I don't even know that's a, that is an unconscious part, so it's downright discriminatory, but to that person, they thought they were doing me a favour. The other one, look, look at this one. Um, don't worry, your husband can, can set up your computer when you get home. This was during the pandemic. So this is a well-meaning person saying, don't worry, get all your stuff, you can go home, and your husband will set up your computer. Uh, who's to say that a man is any better at plugging in computers than a woman? Number two, um, I'm a single parent. I have to do my own, and I'll I am a complete Luddite, I have to admit. But that's nothing to do with the fact I'm a male or female. That's to just the way that my, that's, just, that's just me. The other one is we have a 50-50 split between male and female. The women bring empathy, communication, and EQ. And, and, and I would like anyone to sort of comment on that one as well. This, this, this final one, um, I was in um, a meeting with the hiring manager and a recruiter for a role. And the recruiter went through the shortlist and there were three men on there. And the hiring manager said, uh, have you got any, I would like to see that, you know, there's a balance here. Have you got any um, females that, you know, that you've shortlisted? Well, this candidate, well, she's quite strong-minded. The answer, the Harry manager looked straight at me and said, well, don't all people in the profession, in this profession need to be strong-minded. So I was wondering whether anyone's got any comments about some of these, the, the, some of these statements that have been made to myself and what were their observations? Not really any comments, but we do have a question and, yeah. um, you may be covering this shortly, but definitely something worth expanding on. Mm. How do companies mitigate gender bias in the workplace and decision making? Also, what do you recommend for someone who is experiencing, experiencing this bias? And um, what should they do? Yeah, that's a really good question. I will be, I will be um, hopefully addressing um, some of those issues about the sorts of programs that we can be we can be putting in place. And, and I'll explore those. And in fact, anyone that's experienced this as conscious bias as well, I'll be exploring that um, later on as well. So would you mind if we held off on that? And if, they, if I don't answer the questions through the next couple of slides, I'd be really, the person would like to put up their hand and also I will certainly go through and um, you know answer that question. And if we don't get the time, I will really indulge in, 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 in coming back to you on it, if that's all right. So um, let's have a look at, remember we talked about the, uh, the, the higher up in the organisation, the glass ceiling and why there's no, no females or there are limited females at the top, okay? Mm. In, in, interesting. So uh, I looked at um, some research that goes back to 1887 and I swear I'm sure that this is, is, is not that unheard of, where you hear that women have got smaller brains. And in fact, because they've got smaller brains, um, then they um, are lack originality and intellect, 1887. I, I, I would say just one comment here. Um, Einstein, he had a smaller brain. They, they, they dissected his brain and said, well, he's got a smaller brain, so that, that doesn't hold up. 
And so what about elephants? I mean, elephants more intelligent than humans? Well, no, so that doesn't hold up either. Um, interesting observations. Um, this one's this one's um, interesting too. This is 2006 and you still see this. If you went and did a desktop review and did research into gender differences, talking about men and women and saying that women are better communicators than men, just like on that previous slide I showed you before, they said we've got a 50-50 split and the women have got better EQ, the more collaborative, et cetera. Now, one, one thing I'd like to sort of mention is that the research is saying, in terms of leadership traits, there's really very, very little difference between men, male and female leaders. So why, why are we still saying these sorts of things? And I guess what it really is saying is that we really need to rethink about how gender is, 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 is taken out of, concept, out of context in leadership assessment. And that we need to not look at stereotypes and look at the proper criteria we're going to use and not just say, well, women, uh, women are, 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 um, have got a, a very caring and sensitive. I need someone who's got ambition or I need someone who's got EQ and collaborative with this leadership role, because it's simply not the case. And one thing you need to check yourself about is, and, and we, I, we, you know, we do it all the time. It's like women are better communicators. It's better to say this woman, it appears to be a better communicator, but not all women are, are better communicators and not all men are more ambitious than women. So I think we've really got to look at um, how we objectively assess people in leadership roles. And I think that's what organisations can start to do is look at the criteria and make sure you haven't got some unconscious bias and prejudice when making decisions um, objectively. So I guess what can we do? And hopefully this can answer the question that We'll start to answer the question and maybe start some dialogue here. So on a personal level, be aware of your own um, unconscious biases. Um, understand when you're interacting with others. Seek diversity of opinions. You know, don't jump to conclusions when you're making those decisions. If you see it, call it out, you know. Um, Small things, if you get, you know, I, I was called honey and darling, and it's like, hey, um, please don't call me that. You know, this is how it makes me feel. If you can call it out, call it out. I guess when it comes to um, change and looking at different perspectives, it takes a while for us. But if you can bring these things to the fore in the workplace, I think it's, it's, it really is um, um, a start and bringing it to other people's attention when it is affecting you or you see something that might potentially um, be affecting others, even if it's unconscious. But on a, on a workplace level, change needs to be strategic and systematic. So sure, we could do unconscious bias training, but if it's not part of a bigger program, which takes time, then um, it's going to be piecemeal. It's, it's going to have a quick hour effect and it's just going to go away. So the key to remember in, in these circumstances is to look at your recruitment, okay? Look at your policies. Look at your promotion. Look at your appraisal systems. Make sure that you're breaking down barriers and that you're not making that those um, unconscious bias decisions in the systems that you've got in the organization. And I think that's, that's really important. And I think one of the things is when I sent the sentence person recently they called me honey and dull, he was rather mortified. It, it, it wasn't, it wasn't intentional. Um, I'm not talking about deep sexual harassment issues I'm just talking about someone making a comment but we really do need to call it out we, we do have an obligation to, to call it out as individuals um, but also um, 
I, I do hope that organisations understand that culture is king and it's really important that we start to address these sorts of issues. We have an obligation. And the final point I would make when it comes to unconscious bias is just because it's, it's unintentional in certain circumstances, not in all, it doesn't mean that it should be in the too hard basket. Um, just, just a couple of other points, some research. I did try and do some research in Australia about um, financial um, planners and in researching into um, whether there is gender bias when um, advising clients. And I, I couldn't actually find any particular research, but I came across research for someone called Adrian Penta, who is the exec director of the Center for Women and Wealth at Brown Brothers Harriman. And she did some research and she said she, did, she went in and, and spoke to clients and found that when the advisor came out, that they would talk to the man about their career and talk to the women about their families. Look, I'm sure no offence was meant by this, but um, advisors are, were engaging in, 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 in a manner that they think the clients want and respect, but often those biases are, are, are faulty assumptions. So I think that's important. The, the, as, as I said, we just need to find a way to interrupt some of these things you know, through our policies, our programs, et cetera. Now, going back to the John Hopkins case, which we talked about before, it's the little things. You know what they simply did to stop the unconscious bias? They put a checklist in place to ensure consistency in how they treat males and females. It was as simple as that. Um, so I, I guess that hopefully gives you some thoughts as to what organizations can do and what you can do um, in particular. Um, so I, I guess, was there any comments before we move to, I guess, the, the, the gritty end when we're looking at employment law and what some of the legislative changes that have been made um, that have been handed down by the federal government this year? Has, has anyone got any comments, questions? We do have um, a couple of questions and comments. So, yeah. uh, Going back to the ad examples that you had on SEEK, um, mm. do you have any more examples of how this is affecting financial planning in general? Um, 20 years ago, it was only 20% women and hasn't changed. Seems like there is an invisible barrier to entry based on how the industry presents itself. Mm, mm. I don't have any research and it's really interesting that, um, that um, as an organisation, the AFA, I think this is something where you could really um, open up and have a look at what some of the things that are happening and some research. As I said, I, I, I haven't um, seen um, much research in Australia and I think this is an opportunity for yourselves and the INSPIRE committee to have a look at what is, is, is stopping these things and what sort of interventions need to be made, whether it be um, attracting, um, uh, going to schools, talking to them about the, um, uh, to, uh, uh, being attracted to um, these sorts of roles, whether that is something that you could do. Um, I, I might open that to the panel. What are your thoughts as newly formed? I definitely see a, a new growth in the financial planning industry with females, yeah. but I'm definitely seeing a trend of more support staff being females rather than, mm. than males, yeah. Um, yeah. particularly in just a, a couple of firms that I've worked in. It, it tends to be that um, the staff members are, are female and, and that's not necessarily, um, I guess, you know, they it's discriminating with with males going up to being planners it just seems to be a trend that I've seen um, since I've mm. been in the industry um, mm. and just another comment as well which is is not and, and this is actually quite relevant it's not necessarily just the financial planning industry itself that seems to no. have this unconscious bias it's also towards the clients and how financial planning yes. is selling to the clients we've had a fantastic um entry into the, the chat box and I can definitely resonate with this because I have seen it in yeah. SOA templates most assume the first client is a male and the second mm. is a female and even going as far as doing insurance and selecting occupations um, under females homemaker tends to come up as well so wow. it's not just the planners but but also towards the clients. 
so it's those it's like it's it's those symbols isn't it it's those small things and those small things that you can make a change with and the fact that you know there's an opportunity here that you know women are more financially independent now you know they own we, we own houses we own property we, we we're, we're financially independent yet we're not being represented i mean it's it's, it's an interesting there's a real opportunity here i think um, but a lot of work to be done in this area. Yeah. Any other comments? All right. Let's, um, let's move on to some legislative updates. So these are all, this is, this is factual. Australia does lag behind uh, countries in preventing and responding to sexual harassment. That, 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 that is a fact. Um, and uh, the Human Rights Commission, this is quite sobering that one in three people, male or female, feel that they've been sexually harassed at work. You know, and sexual harassment can range from name calling, um, innuendos, gossip, um, you know, in, right through to the belittling through to the... Um, the really um, quite confronting sexual harassment that, you know, we think of, it, it is a whole spectrum. And the interesting thing is only 17% um, report um, sexual harassment through their workplace procedures. And we'll, 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 we'll sort of look at this in, 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 in a little bit more detail in a minute. But I do think that employees need to take greater responsibility um, in terms of transparency and accountability and leadership. Um, not only from an ethical and moral point of view, but it really makes good economic sense to have that diversity of view and to have a good culture. If you have a good culture, you have productive people. If you have productive people, you retain people. You retain people, you have a greater profitability. Um, you know, the, the facts speak for themselves. But it's really, really important that, you know, we look towards um, having a safe, harassment-free workplace where people can feel that they're productive. And I guess there's been quite a lot of attention, hasn't there, with, um, you know, Brittany Higgins and, and Christine Holgate um, and uh, Brittany standing up and saying, no, that's not acceptable. And interestingly, there was no legislation covering parliamentarians and um, judges. Um, and it's only recently come in, which I'll, I'll talk about in a minute in terms of the legislation. And it's interesting, um, Christine Holgate um, was interviewed and I'll just quote as she says, uh, do you believe that the bullying that you've seen is partly a gender issue? And she said, um, you're absolutely right, I do. Miss Holgate then said in inquiry hearings, but I do believe the real problem here is bullying and harassment and abuse of power. Is it that? And she said, it absolutely is. So um, these are sorts of things that we need to turn around. And um, I'll, I'll go through some of the changes in the employment law that were handed out down in April of this year. Now, Kate Jenkins, she put a report together, started it, it took 12 months to put a report together, um, respecting the workplace. Um, she was the uh, uh, Human Rights Commissioner and it was handed out in March, 2020. Um, I think the pandemic had a bit of an impact on what, when the legislation was rolled out. There was a lot of things going on. And there were 55 recommendations made in the report. And what they're saying is that, um, you know, uh, organisations um, need to take uh, more ownership in, in, in these things. And indeed, um, in uh, the, the, the government as well. But some of the key changes which... Um, I think um, have got merit is that there's the time limit for um, making a claim for sexual harassment has gone up to 24 months rather than six because um, I think they acknowledge that the impact on um, individuals is, is um, enormously high um, and it might take them a while to actually um, uh, go through uh, and process this. Um, I guess before I go into more detail on, um, you know, uh, you know the, the the legislation, which is there for you to read, my question does does would anyone feel comfortable um, anonymously talking about um, uh, not talking but um, sending through um, something that may have happened to them or 
um, uh, if anyone um, would like to talk about um, uh, from the panel, um, I could talk about some of my um, things that have happened to me. Would anyone like to share their thoughts on things that have happened to them, bearing in mind only 17% of the people actually report it? Yeah, Angela, I might jump in. Um, okay. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. So we, as as the panelists, sort of um, just had a bit of a discussion the other day yeah. about some instances, specifically um, from my end, working uh, within the financial planning industry. Yeah, the client services manager. Um, at the time, I went into some specific things that I've experienced, and I won't I won't delve into that now. No. Um, no. But essentially, um, the reason I joined the Inspire AFA team was to help support women who have had experiences where they've not necessarily felt as though they have a sexual harassment claim to make, yeah. but they've been made to feel ridiculed, isolated, uncomfortable within the workplace. Um, and for me, my experiences, uh, I've really internalised the messages that I received uh, throughout mm. my career um, mm. from specifically certain men um, mm. about the way that I look or the way that I present myself. Um, and it's, it's, it has taken me a lot of time um, to rebuild a lot of confidence that was lost after some specific events. Mm. Um, and essentially, I think just to, to everybody that's attended today and the panellists and, and anybody that works within the industry, Inspire wants to set up a committee or a channel for women and men um, to come through and, and talk anonymously about your experiences. Um, I did see that only 17% of people really report those issues because a lot of the time we're made to think that, you know, sexual harassment has to be this big event or this big issue, but it can be, you know, it can be, you know, harassment and bullying over time. Um, and it beats you mm -hmm. down to a point where you think, oh, this is just normal. Or this is just something mm -hmm. that I, I, I brought upon myself and now it's too late to mention anything or the HR team is too close with my boss. You know, I think that um, Inspire wants to offer a, a place for people to come and voice what they're experiencing so that we can help validate that experience and validate your feelings and, and let you know that, that you're not alone. Mm. Thank you for that. I, I really appreciate that you you know you shared that um, um, with with the group. Um, and did it take you a while to um, I guess process that? I mean, I made the point of it being twenty four months. They have um, fortunately moved that from six. Um, not saying yeah. that you, you wish to do that, but it does keep up, give people that opportunity. Yeah, it's taken me years, honestly, and mm. and even and even today there'll be moments where I get that sort of feeling of imposter syndrome. Like mm. I, I don't deserve to be here. I'm not smart Ooh. enough to be here because I'm just, I'm just a blonde girl and I'm here because somebody just wanted to look at me. Um, and that's just mm. that message that I heard years ago um, mm. that I'm still that person. And, mm. and it takes a lot of time and a lot of self-reflection to get over that. Um, but essentially I think at the time, if I, if I knew that there was a channel I could go to, go to and um, mm -hmm. community of supportive women, I would have felt a lot safer. And I also would have had the confidence to leave that workplace a hell of a lot earlier. Mm. Well, one of the things that I think is important is that um, um, set, setting up um, mentoring um, uh, groups where people feel like they can go and talk and click with someone and talk about their issues. Some of them might have gone through it themselves. When you when you allocate yourself to a mentor, it's a natural thing. It's someone that you feel comfortable in sharing things with. And so I really encourage people to network and share some of these things and get some advice. Um, a lot of you don't work in organisations which maybe don't have HR, um, but there are um, there is support out there. There is support out there. Um, I think. The, the law that we've got is is the law it, it, it's it's there for a reason um and but, but there are so many other things that um we need to support people with it's the psych it's like the psychology behind it as well it's feeling safe it's not just about the law 
that's the end result. But it's the journey before that we need to support um, people through. I feel like they have that ability to speak up. And I do hope, I do hope that things are beginning to change in, in, in this area. I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic. There is a long way to go, absolutely. Um, but I think we are moving in the right direction. And maybe we can maybe regroup back to, if anyone's got more questions, please feel free. I might just regroup back to the um, summary of the legislation. Another one, which I thought is quite a powerful one is extending stop bullying orders. Now, these are things in the, the fair work where you can go to fair work previously and say, I'm being bullied. And it's almost like an AVI. It's like, stop bullying me. You can also say it's now includes sexual harassment. You can go to fair work and say, stop that. That's not appropriate. Um, they have include judges and members of parliament, which is important. And also the fact that there are now um, uh, the caps on damages are unlimited, whereas before they weren't. So I do hope that this is the start um, of things to come. Uh, legislation can only go so far. Um, it's also up to organisations as well to take on board. And, and I think one of the things, if I go to the next slide, is, um, is some other initiatives that perhaps organisations can look at. Um, so um, I know Marie for Futurity um, Investments and um, we have put in a, um, a, a couple of, um, a, I guess, programs in place to look at gender and making sure that we've got gender neutral policies, for example, one on parental leave, which is, I don't, it doesn't matter if you're the male or the female, um, you can take parental leave. So it encourages men to take the time off encourages um, women to continue with their career as well. Um, but the other thing that um, I have recently worked on and will be rolled out is um, whistleblowing policy. Now, I know this doesn't cover everyone um, within your industry because you have to be of a certain size. But I, I wanna make a couple of points about that, that um, if you're a public company and your turnover is above a certain amount, you're required to have a whistleblowing policy. And what this is, the whistleblowing, I looked into the legislation of the Corporations Act, which has been drafted by lawyers, and I was thinking um, it talked about other issues that systemically impact on the organisation. So to me, that sexual harassment, of course, it impacts, it, it, it impacts reputation, it, um, culture, which is important. And it impacts from an ethics point of view just in so many ways. And so the whistleblowing policy, and, and, I, and I did get clarity, is I've made it very explicit that if you're being sexually harassed, and it's I'm, I, I'm talking about quite systemic, of course, um, you can use the whistleblowing protections. And what that means is that you can't, um, can't receive um, uh, inappropriate treatment, whether it be victimization. Um, there can be no detrimental conduct made to you. And what we're talking about there is you can't be sacked. You can't receive a poor performance review. Um, all of these things, you have a, you're, it's like a protective disclosure. Now, I know a lot of organizations Aren't, don't necessarily that fall into like a, a medium organization or they don't have a HR person. They don't necessarily require a whistleblowing policy, but it doesn't mean that you can't whistleblow to ASIC and say this or an investor or, or, or an employee can't go to ASIC and say, look, um, there's sexual harassment happening here. So my um, advice is, um, lobby to, to look at getting a whistleblowing policy in place. It looks good to the investor. It looks that you've got a good culture. Um, it protects the individuals. So whilst it's not needed, maybe it's something that you voluntarily do um, where you protect the individuals under, under, the, um, under the Corpse Act. So just some couple of things just wor wor worthy of mention. Um, so I guess, just to summarize some, some of the things that um, we've talked about under sexual harassment. Look, I think organizations have really got to take a stand here and create a safe workplace where employees can speak up. At the end of the day, 
um, purely see it from even just a supply and demand exchange of services. People are your most expensive asset. You're, they're, they're your best asset. So of, um, focus on attracting the best talent and make them feel safe. Now, I, I, I did speak to someone from um, a financial advisor yesterday, and he said to me that FAs are leaving. Um, he said there was something in the AR, uh, AFR that um, uh, advisors are leaving. And 2018, you had 27 and a half, and 2023, they predict is 13,000. And um, if there's going to be a war for talent, and, and apparently the reason is, as many reasons, there's a lot of um, uh, things put on to advisors, whether it be compliance and education and ASIC, all putting these things upon you. And that's why a lot of advisors are, are leaving, um, leaving the, the, the marketplace. But you can have a war for talent. So you might as well get, create a really good culture because culture is king. It means that um, you're going to attract and you're going to, retain and I guess the other important thing is it has to come from the top it really does um, but as we said before some other things that um, you can do is you know talk to a counsellor there are people out there um, you know sp speak up if you can get to know your rights make an assessment of what you should do get yourself a mentor in the industry um, use EFA use the Inspire group you know, um, they're a newly formed group. Um, they're going to be looking at lots of initiatives here. And call it out. It's not just so it happens to you, but call it out um, to others as well, if it's happening to others as well. I think that's that's, um, a, that's a really important point. So it, it, to summarise, um, I'm just conscious that um, we're, we're, we're heading towards the, the 12 o'clock mark. Well, um, did anyone have any questions or comments um, that are open to the participants and also to the panel before we wrap up? Just a couple. So yeah. given that you've worked with a lot of companies and, and building whistleblowing policies, would you therefore agree that there's a stigma attached to women who talk about the fact that they've been sexually harassed and how can we look to remove that? Because I know... Um, for a lot of people, that would be a big reason as to why they don't want to come forward. They don't want to be labelled as someone who's been harassed or, you know, if you're working for a big company, you don't want to be someone who's then out in the media. Um, it can be quite confronting. Yeah, look, that is a real reality. Um, and that's why I think whistleblowing is a really, it, it, it does protect the, the individual um, from detrimental conduct. I have seen it, I'll be honest with you. Um, you know, we talk about 17% have, have raised, it, um, have been reported. Um, Got to be very careful with the grievance procedure. That is the internal grievance procedure because, um, uh, women have had to sign non-disclosure agreements, confidentiality agreements, so they can't talk about it. So it's systematically being underreported. Um, so the reality is you are further protected through whistleblowing. Absolutely. Um, that, you know, you have those protections against being victimised um, or sacked. Um, there's a confidentiality. It's very, very, very strict. Um, I'm not saying that grievance procedures in the right hands don't work, but they um, I've, I've seen sometimes that they don't work and um, confidentiality is breached, um, and uh, which I think, you know, um, it causes some issues. And that's why I'm suggesting um, if you can whistleblow, um, that's why I've made it. I've made it in there. I've, I've, I've made it clear that uh, made it quite explicit in, in, in the futurity policy. Mm. And what can we do? Well, I guess the legislation and keep um, lobbying for things to occur and speaking up um, is important. And, and not working in organisations where um, the culture uh, is, 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 is accepts this. There are organisations that um, don't accept this. Um, uh, Marie, you had an example, didn't you? Mm. That you might want to share. Sure. Um, yeah, a few years ago, I was working um, for an organisation that was male dominated. I was the only female in my team, but it was still a support of an inclusive culture. I never felt um, that that was an issue for me, but I was approached by um, another person working in a different organisation that said, oh, you should come and uh, work for us. There's an opening. 
but I was very aware there was a boy, a old boys kind of club culture there and I wasn't attracted to work there. And he had said to me, oh, but we're trying to change that. Hopefully you come across and you can help us change that, that culture. And it just wasn't attractive to me. I was happy where I was. Um, I just didn't want to leave um, an organisation that I felt happy to be at and supported to join somewhere where I feel like I would just be, you know, pushing, you know, what uphill. So I just thought I'm just going to, yeah, I'm just going to say where I am. So I think it's important to, to be very aware of what team you're joining and um, what culture they have because it can really be off-putting or attractive on that, in that sense. Mm, make, making those um, decisions um, is really important. Um, uh, and I think my passion is helping small organisations um, uh, improve their culture and looking at ways to do it. It takes time, um, but I'm passionate about it. Um, but of course, it has to come from the top. You know, at the end of the day, um, I, 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 you can't do it in a piecemeal way. Um, and it's about pointing things out. It's about putting programs in place. It's about um, getting, you know, um, different perspectives heard, getting women into more senior roles wherever you can, looking at those opportunities, um, looking at all your systems, all your promotions, like the appraisals. Like, it, it, here's an interesting one. Um, the flexible working policy, it can have some, like with the changes that are happening with um, COVID, and we're all going back to the workplace. I was told, no, everyone's going to be back in the workplace. This is a, this is a client that I'm working with um, um, at the moment, a very small client, it's about 25 people. And they said, no, we're all going to be back in. And I said, because um, he said, because decisions get made in the workplace, face-to-face -face in the office. And I said, well, that's going to be detrimental. Have you ever thought of it, seeing it the other way, that women um, are the ones that are the carers and they'll stay at home and the men will go in and they'll miss out on the decision-making. It's making sure that when you make decisions, you don't go back to, um, uh, to your default position. You really question why you're doing what you're doing and how do you bring out the best in your staff? And he did stop and he said, yeah, you know, you've really got a good point there. Um, yeah, we've got to be collaborative and I understand that, but yeah, you're right. Um, we've got to change our whole paradigm about decisions being made face to face. We've proven that, that, that we don't have to do that. I said, yeah, it, it's just those little subtle things. Okay, I'm conscious of time. Um, uh, so um, do I pass on to the panelists just to wrap up? Um, yeah. Uh, um, yeah. We'll finish up here. Thank you so yeah, much, Angela. No that was really amazing and really insightful. And thank you to everybody that that joined in on the webinar. It's great to see so many of you here and, and see everybody interacting. Um, we love the questions and, and love all your stories. Um, in addition to that, just wanted to let anybody know um, we are, as an Inspire team, sort of working on a way to set up a community for people to come and um, talk about any sort of sexual harassment or bias, um, just anonymously and casually, um, and ways that we can sort of assist you and steer you in the right direction for proper help if it, you need it. Um, as well, we'll also be holding another webinar in February. Um, more details about that one will be upcoming. But thank you so much, Angela, and, and thank you, everybody, for joining in. It was great to see you all. Well, thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Thank you, FA. Beautiful. All right. Cheers. Thanks, thank everyone. You, Angela. Bye. Bye.